Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Ecclesiastes 10. Be looking at Ecclesiastes 10, 16 through 11, 6. We are nearly finished with the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, three more weeks left, leading us right up into Thanksgiving. As we study the book of Ecclesiastes, three weeks from the end here, we're going to talk about the concept of maturity. In these last day, in these last several weeks of, of Ecclesiastes, as Solomon has been uh, telling us uh, of wisdom, his final conclusions in regard to this book and in regard to, to um, his exhortation, we're going to see him turn his eyes. He's never really left this focus, but more so we're going to see the focus turn towards young people, towards serving God with your youth, toward not wasting your days. What much of Ecclesiastes is about is Solomon saying he wasted his days. And he's hoping, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the wasted days that he lived would, not, would, would, would be a lesson so that you won't have to waste yours. We have said for the last month, and we've been quoting those verses together in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, that God comforts us in our tribulation that we may comfort others with the comfort wherewith we ourselves have been comforted of God. What Solomon is doing in Ecclesiastes is that he has gone through some hard days. He's had to learn some lessons the hard way. He's validated wisdom and truth by rebelling against wisdom and truth and having to live through the lessons of his rebellion. And now he's saying... Let my mistakes be your lessons so that you don't have to make these mistakes as well. So last week we talked about the fool and the particularly foolish words, right? We talked about foolish words and we asked ourselves, not just are we avoiding foolish words, but are our words wise? And we connected that to the New Testament, Ephesians 4.29, that our words are filled with grace. This week we're going to talk about maturity. And again, to, to some degree, we're, we're focusing on, in on young people, but to some degree we may not be. <laughs> because see, our culture has a maturity problem, doesn't it? People living in perpetual adolescence. A society where people aren't growing up because of many reasons. One of which is that our country has so much wealth, so much prosperity, that in some ways we really aren't required to grow up. But today Solomon is going to give us some Proverbs which I'd like to label the marks of maturity. What Solomon is going to describe in our time together are attitudes and actions which reflect growing up. And we're going to start with, with the physical because that's much of what Solomon is speaking of, but we're going to talk about the spiritual as well. Spiritual maturity. When directed by the Holy Spirit in the lives of we who are in Christ, these mature attitudes on life can cause us not just to be legitimately useful to our families and to society and those things which maturity bring, but legitimately useful to Christ. And that's where we want to be. Far be it from us that the one thing standing between us and God's ability to use us is that we just aren't willing to grow up. So we'll lay down a premise upon which we need to build, and then we'll build upon it. The premise is that though there are those in our society and that it has touched the church who have a maturity problem, that you're living in such a way that you're not living up to your potential, to what Christ could do through you. You're too distracted to be useful you're too busy thinking about yourself to be helpful. You're too busy being and doing what you want to be or doing what you want to do to meet the needs of others. And it's time to grow up. So let's walk through the end of Ecclesiastes 10. We're going to get into Ecclesiastes 11 today. And we'll start with verses 16 and 17 of Ecclesiastes 10. The Bible says this. Woe unto thee, O land, when thy, child is, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, 
when thy king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Now our text opens today with an important contrast that spans these two verses. Uh, Solomon begins with the, the woe and he says, woe unto the land in verse 16 where the king is a child and their princes eat in the morning. Now the thing about this, common wisdom tells us that it is not necessarily a bad thing when a king is young in age as long as he does a good job of being king, right? Likewise, there's not necessarily a problem with a prince, a nobility, someone in leadership who would eat in the morning. I mean, I'm your pastor and I ate this morning. So that can't necessarily be what the Bible's talking about, right? It's not talking about you're not allowed to eat breakfast. <laughs> and that's why seven, verse 17 is important to us. Because this is the contrast that shows us what he's saying in verse 16. He contrasts the statements in verse 16 with this. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles. So we are now contrasting thy king is a child with thy king is a son of nobles. Now, uh, we wouldn't necessarily correlate those two. A child can be the son of a noble. So we're not talking about age here explicitly. Likewise, what does he say? And thy princes eat in due season. So the contrast for for strength and not for drunkenness. So the contrast is between eating in the morning and eating at an appropriate season, not for drunkenness, but for strength, for health. So Solomon is not saying the problem is having a young in age king, but rather the problem is when a king is not the son of nobles. He, he's not acting in a manner that is befitting the position that he has. His level of deportment does not befit his office. Solomon says that's going to cause problems in your nation. And he continues then, and he says, um, excuse me, I lost my place here a little bit. And then he says, uh, when princes eat in the morning, and he contrasts that with princes eating in due season for their strength and not for drunkenness. So we see this contrast here. And in this contrast, we see that eating in the morning is not that they are eating breakfast, but rather that they are pursuing early in the day drunkenness, reveling. They are making themselves useless as a, as a function of leadership because their mind from the very moment they wake up in the morning is, how am I going to have fun today? How am I going to do whatever I want to do today? And they have rejected the sound wisdom that I'm a leader. And because I'm a leader, I have responsibilities. I have a responsibility to my people. I have a responsibility to my God. And so I'm going to live out those responsibilities. I'm not going to be eat to be gluttonous. I'm not going to drink to be drunken. I'm going to do so for strength to lead my people and to serve the Lord. God would say a very similar concept through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11. Isaiah wrote, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them drunkards. Those who live in a make-believe world of intoxication, bringing themselves outside of reality so that they can live in this fake world, of, you're of no good to anyone, Right? Solomon particularly says, woe unto the leader who is no, of no good to anyone because he's so busy focused on himself and what he wants and his own pleasure. From the minute he wakes up, he simply says, what am I going to do today for me? Not for my people. I'm a prince, but I don't care about my people. I care about me. They use their position and their power to feed themselves, to please themselves, and not to serve others. That's the woe that we see in verses 16 and 17. That's the general message of Solomon. There's a great advantage to those who live under a leader who lacks the maturity necessary to do his job properly. It is a great disadvantage to those who live under a leader who uses his authority, his position, or his wealth as an excuse to waste time rather than as a motivation to be a good steward. Woe unto the land who has a childish and immature leader men who have never grown up and realized that people depend on them and that they have work to do. Woe unto the land whose leader takes advantage of their position to be lazy rather than to serve their people. They use their special privileges to please themselves rather than to affect change and, and, and to bless their people. 
Woe unto the land whose kings and princes lack the maturity to do what the position asks of them to do, who rather take advantage of their position to serve themselves. And this, as Solomon states in, uh, at the beginning of verse 16, is childish. When he says, woe unto you whose king is a child, why would, he, why, why, why would he make this correlation? Now, we talked a little bit about children last week in foolish words as well. Children are such a great example of foolishness and immaturity, right? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. We know this. Children are by nature immature, and we have to help them become mature. And this idea, your king is a child, he lives for himself, he works for himself, is how children operate, is it not? My children wake up in the morning. My oldest are almost six. Then we get down to, to Benjamin at, at, at three and Erene at, at one. And as we look at these children, they wake up and on their mind is toys, dolls, kids, uh, you know, fake food. We're going to play. We're going to play all day, right? They don't get up and start washing dishes, sweeping floors, that has to be trained into them. That takes effort. That takes diligence. That takes direction. That's not natural because the natural state of the child is me, 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 me. My little, my, uh, our little girl, Erene, she just turned one years old last Monday. And when we sit down for a meal, she's hungry. Now, everybody's hungry when we sit down for a meal. And there's plenty of things to do to, when we sit down for a meal. You set everyone down and then you've got to get cups filled and then you've got to get, you know, you've got your plates and your food and you've got to get it served and it's got to cool down and you've got to cut it up and all of these things. She doesn't care about any of that. You put her in that high chair and she's going, ah! She's got to have her food. She wants her food now. She doesn't care that sister is hungry and that brother is hungry and that dad is hungry. And that, it doesn't matter. It's about her. Life is about her. That's how children think. Solomon says, woe unto the person who never gets over that. The person who wakes up and says, life is about me today. Serve me. Think of me. I'm going to do what I want to do today. It's about me. I'm going to go to my place of employment, but it's still about me. I'm going to go to my church, but it's still about me. I'm going to serve serve in some capacity, but you know what? There's no service there because it's still about me. And Solomon says, it's not right. It's a symptom of childishness. And it's a mark of immaturity. Verses 18 and 19. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth. And through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Solomon gives proverbial wisdom, but which we might also label to some degree common sense. Solomon uses a word here which we find for the first time in Ecclesiastes, but it's used 17 times in our Bible, at least as it's translated in our King James, slothful. It's a word derived from an animal that is called a sloth. Sloths are officially categorized as the world's slowest animal. They don't move a whole lot. So little, in fact, that algae actually grows on their fur. That's why they look a little bit green when you see them. That's not their normal color. But algae is growing on them because they move so little. And so this word has become an adjective to describe those who don't move much, who are idle, who are lazy, who don't do things. Solomon says, by slothfulness, laziness, idleness, buildings decay. Through idleness, the hands of a uh, the, the, the idle hands, the house drops through. He acknowledges a law of the universe, a hallmark of God's design. It's actually uh, uh, mirrored in, in the laws of thermodynamics for you science folk. Second law of thermodynamics, to be precise. But the idea is this, that everything tends towards order and decay. Barring some deliberate intervention, everything breaks down. Have you ever noticed that if you clean something, you, okay, so we clean the kitchen, right? Now, if I were to clean the kitchen and then say, okay, everybody stay out of the kitchen, a week later, there would be dust that falls on it, right? A month later, there might be a drip in the faucet. 
a year later, we might start seeing pain. Just even if I don't use it much, it's going to tend toward decay. Now, if you use it, then of course, every day you have to clean the kitchen, right? Because you use it and it falls towards disorder. Everything tends toward disorder. If you don't clean your house, your house is not just going to stay at the level that you left it. It's going to get messier. If you don't repair your house, your house is not just going to stay at the level you left it. It's going to break down. If you don't maintain your vehicle, it's not just going to stay at the level you left it when, when you started. It's going to break down. In the context, Solomon again links these attributes to those who lack maturity to do what is necessary and proper. The childish leader who fails in his responsibilities because they're so focused on self-pleasure, now the lazy people who fail in their responsibilities because they lack the character to take care of what they have and to get up and do what's necessary to maintain it. Whether that's your spiritual life, whether that is your children, whether that is your home. Parents, you know that you can't just hope your children turn out right. It doesn't work that way, does it? If your children turn out right, it's not going to be because you just ignored them and, and, and hoped that they, by some form of osmosis, gleaned what they needed to become right people. It takes effort. It takes effort to raise children. It takes effort to keep a house up. Home ownership is tough business, isn't it? There's always something to do. And once you've done everything, the new list starts. Same with maintaining vehicles, everything. It all, it, it all tends towards decay. And if we let it decay, Solomon says, things are going to fall through. The house is going to fall through. What's the point? The point is that we need to be, we need to have initiative. We need to, a mark of maturity is that we have initiative. A mark of immaturity is that we're lazy, that we're idle. Then he says in verse 19, a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry, but money answereth all things. Solomon says, you know, the feasts are fun and everyone likes to have fun. That merriment is a good thing, but if our life is devoted to merriment, that's going to have to end at some point. Why? Because merriment takes money. And that means at some point you have to have some initiative. In the context of the leaders of the land, they can pursue lavish feasting one of two ways. So these princes that wake up early and they feast all day, they can do it one of two ways. Either way, though, it's going to be on the back of someone that has initiative. They can either tax their people to death and take their people's money so that they can live their lavish lifestyle. Lavish lifestyle. And so they're living off of the initiative of their people. Or they can be good leaders, build a prosperous nation, a nation that is prosperous then, and then they can live lavishly because of prosperity and diligence. One way or another, though, it all, someone has to have initiative, right? In order for things, so someone's got to gotta farm the land that gets the food to the prince's table. Someone's got to make the clothes that get onto the prince's back. Someone at some point has to have initiative in order for the feasting and the merriment to take place. The final verse in chapter 10 tells us this. Verse 20, Curse not the king, no, not in thought, thy thoughts. Curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the, the, the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. To this point, Solomon gives these principles in relationship to leaders, right? We've seen this, woe unto uh, leaders who are immature, woe unto those who are idle and who are slothful and who are lazy. And now Solomon turns his warning toward those who might be listening to his wisdom and thinking of their own leaders and saying, yep, that's my rulers, right? <laughs> that's them. They're childish and they're lazy and they're slothful and thus begin to abuse and curse their leaders. Solomon appeals to those listeners to avoid this. And he does so on practical grounds that when you say evil things about your leaders or against those in influence, expect that somehow in some way it very well might get back to them and then through their power and influence might make life pretty hard on you. Solomon gives essence to the danger by saying a bird of the air will carry your voice to them. We, we use the phrase, the walls have ears, right? The idea that you never actually fully know who's listening and who's not. That when you say negative things about people, 
and someone overhears you, you may not have expected it, somehow it gets back to the one person you didn't want it to get back to. There's wisdom there. But we know that this is also a biblical principle, right? We talked about it a little while back in Ecclesiastes. We've talked about it before. The admonition is far more than just the practicality of saying, don't, let, don't, don't say evil things about those in power because it can get back to them. But we understand that all the way back to Exodus 22, verse 28, God does not want us to speak ill of our leaders. Thou shalt not revile the gods, he said in Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight, 28, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Uh, two particular um, uh, authoritative entities here that God says not to curse. One, don't curse false gods, demonic powers. Don't curse them. Second, don't curse physical rulers of your people. Paul would cite this in Acts 23, verse 5. Paul is standing before the Sanhedrin council. He rebukes a representative of the government only to find out that that re re representative, that re excuse me, representative that he rebuked was the high priest. He didn't know that. So we read Paul repent of his actions. Acts 23, verses three through five. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. He's calling him a hypocrite there, which he was. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? So, so what Paul said was not wrong. The man was being hypocritical. But he was saying it to the leader of his people. And so look what Paul says. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the rule of thy people. He said, Yeah, I shouldn't have said that if he's the ruler of my people. Doesn't matter if it was true. I shouldn't have said it. We have even more New Testament precedent warning about speaking ill of rulers, both the spiritual and the physical. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, Peter tells us this, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And if you go and you study out that passage, you'll find a great emphasis upon submission to earthly authorities. We know from uh, in Romans 13, we see that as well. Peter, 2 Peter and Jude continue the warning in Exodus about not reviling the gods. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, Peter says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, he's talking about false teachers, and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Peter is speaking of dignities there and we'll find as we link this to Jude that he's speaking of speaking against demonic powers as if somehow we can revile them without consequence. God says, do not speak evil, revile demonic powers. Say, pastor, what does that really mean? Let's look at Jude. In Jude, verses 8 through 10, Jude only has one chapter. But in Jude, verses 8 through 10, Jude writes this, Likewise also these filthy dreamers devile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts and those things they corrupt themselves. If I can give this a modern day, if I can link this to a modern day, perhaps something you could relate to. Have you ever been watching TV and there's an evangelist on the TV and generally speaking, it would be a charismatic evangelist like a Kenneth Copeland type that would say something like this and he would say, devil, I rebuke you, devil, I rebuke you, uh, illness, I rebuke you, and, and he's rebuking demonic spirits. That's the exact thing Jude and Second Peter say is that they are ignorant fools, that they have no idea what they're doing. Even Michael the archangel would not say, Satan, I rebuke thee. He said, Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. That's God's authority to rebuke you, not mine. So, all of bringing that back to the Exodus concept, don't rebuke the gods, don't rebuke your leaders. God ordains leaders. We need to be careful. You know, we've uh, had a roller coaster of leadership in this country over the past 10 years. There's not a lot of leaders in our government that are doing anything worthwhile. But we need to be careful about how we speak of them, biblically speaking. Because even practically speaking here, 
Solomon says, curse not the king. Not in thy thought, not in thy bedchamber, not even in private, because you never know. But biblically speaking, here's what we do know. God always hears. And if God has said, don't do something, we'd be well advised not to do it. We continue in chapter 11. Solomon says this, cast thy bread upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. There are two very different interpretations of this that different people give. The reason why I'm including it in the message today is I believe Solomon is actually continuing his thought and so I'm going to give you the interpretation I think is probably not uh, the one that I'm not in favor of first. And then we'll talk about the one that I believe, at least as far as I'm interpreting it for today's sake, that, that I'm comfortable with. The first regards it as an exhortation unto charity, that when you're casting your bread upon waters, that means that you're distributing to the necessity of everyone. And it's based upon, upon a story that's given in what's called the Midrash. The Midrash is a Jewish teaching on the first five books of the Old Testament. And in the Midrash, there's this story about a, a Jewish rabbi. And the Jewish rabbi sees a man, a learned teacher of the Jews, get on a boat. And he gets all on this boat. And then that, as that boat sails away, there's a great storm that comes up and that boat is destroyed. And as far as everybody knows, everybody, everybody upon that boat is destroyed. And then as the story goes, that man then goes to one of the, the cities of, of Israel and he sees this learned teacher who he saw get on that boat teaching in that city. Now again, this is not Bible, right? This is Jewish tradition. So don't, this is not Bible here. A and he sees that man teaching and he goes up to that man and he says, I, th I saw you get on this boat. What happened? And that Jewish teacher says, well, when I got onto that boat, I had this loaf of bread and I gave it to one of the poor men on that boat. And that poor man said, the Lord bless you. May, may the Lord save your life as you saved mine. And the principle being that when we give to others, when we uh, um, yield ourselves to others without respect of reward, that God rewards us in turn, which is a biblical principle. To this end, verse two then, give thy portion to seven and also to eight, would speak of a man who gives to, unto perfection, unto completion, right? Eight often indicating infinitude in the Bible. And with this warning, because uh, you don't know what's evil upon the earth, so you give to everyone in need and you help as many people as you can. Not necessarily a bad lesson at all, but not what I believe the Bible is saying here. What I believe Solomon is saying here is more towards prudence than it is towards generosity. As we look at the context, as we look at what he's been saying in chapter 10 about uh, kings being children and immaturity and, 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 and selfishness and laziness, I think the continued context will bear out that this is saying something slightly different. If I may liken it to an element of finan financial planning in our world, I believe Solomon is saying something to the effect of diversify your portfolio. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Spread your bread, your means of living, upon the waters, which will carry them in different directions so that no matter which direction the wind blows your boat, you have bread there. Give a portion or seven or eight. Send portions in many directions because you simply don't know what evil will come upon the earth. In other words, the mature man is not a short-sighted man. He is a prudent man. He thinks ahead. He doesn't just act in the interest of today. He acts in the interest of tomorrow. He plans for tomorrow and anticipates the possibilities of danger and so prepares himself and his household because evil makes our days uncertain. Thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. This nicely aligns with the next several verses. In verse three, he says this, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. You don't have any control over if the cloud dumps the rain or if the cloud doesn't dump the rain. So you need to be prepared for either. You don't have any control over whether the fa tree falls to the north or to the south. So you need to have a plan for either. We've got some big oak trees in our yard. Hopefully they won't fall down in our lifetime. But if they were to fall down in our lifetime, I don't know if they're going to fall away from the house or toward the house. I don't know if they're going to fall onto the road, onto the yard, or onto my roof. But it might be good to start thinking ahead a little bit. There's some big branches above my roof. Maybe they're starting to look a little sickly. I'll just cut those down before they fall on my roof. There's some prudence to that, right? 
There's some, some, some looking ahead there. Solomon teaches in verse four, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. If I spend all my time observing the weather, waiting for the perfect time and the perfect circumstance, when will I plant? If I spend all my time thinking and I never get around to doing, when am I going to be good for anything? An imperfect plan implemented is better than a perfect plan that is never acted out because you're trying to make it perfect. This is a mark of maturity. It's a mark of immaturity when for various reasons of our own, we become so caught up in the details or in the fears of what may be that we lack the ability to move forward on anything. I, like most people, have things to do around the house. I'm a homeowner, which means there's always a to-do list. We talked about that already. One of the things I need to do is mow the lawn. If I waited for the perfect day to mow the lawn, the lawn would never get mowed. If I waited for the perfect time where the weather's right, the condition of the lawn is good, my health, my priorities, my things to do, my to-do list, the people to see, the lawn would never get mowed. At some point, I just need to say, you know what? I'm going to go out and mow that lawn. It's a little windier than I'd like. It's a little cooler than I'd like. It's a little warmer than I'd like. It's a little, it's a, the lawn's a little more moist than I'd like. The lawn's a little more dry than I'd like. But you know what? It's, the, that lawn's just got to get mowed or else it's never going to get mowed, right? There are some who get so caught up in or daunted by details that they never get anything going. And so a man, a family, an organization, a church gets so busy planning or thinking or not thinking or not planning that nothing's ever done. Solomon continues in verses 5 and 6. This is where we'll finish our exposition, then we'll apply today. In the same way, you don't know the way of the Spirit Oh, excuse me. Verses five and six. Let's, let's, let's read it and then we'll talk about it. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Do you see why I believe the context of verses one and two is probably more about planning than about charity because verses three, four, five, and six are all about that. We don't know how the spirit works, the spirit of a man, how it all works. How is it that we can commune with God? How is it that the spirit of man communes with the spirit of God? Uh, we don't know the way of the spirit. Je John, Jesus said in John chapter three that the spirit is as the wind. It comes from a direction. It goes from a direction and we just don't know where it's coming or where it's going. But here's the thing, if we're so indecisive or if we're so careful or if we're so unwilling to commit until we know everything about something that we wait until we understand how the spirit communes with God to let our spirits commune with God, then we'll never commune with God. In the same way, we don't know how a child is formed. And we don't know the miracle of, uh, of, of a child being formed. We don't know all of that. We have ultrasounds. We can see things happening. But, but how is it that that takes place? Scientists are baffled. And if I waited until I understood the process to have children, no one would have children. It's a sign of immaturity when we get so caught up in these details that we can't move forward, that we can't make decisions. I had surgery a few weeks ago and the CRNA who was there prepping me for anesthesia inserted a needle into my hand. And as he did so, he said, you're going to probably taste something in your mouth and maybe feel something cold. And here we go. He put it in, popped the thing in, taped it up, and I tasted some weird thing in my mouth, and I felt some coldness in my mouth. And I said, that's really interesting. Why does it do that? Here was his response, maybe a little more honest than he should have been. He said, like most medications, we really don't know. <laughs> right? That's what he said. He said, like most medications, we really don't understand why these things happen. So here's the thing. We don't know a lot about the medications we put into our bodies. We don't know a lot about the, the, the things that... The, the, there, there are, we don't understand the brain well enough, the body well enough, but what we know is we put it in and it works. And then these are the general side effects. And sometimes people have different side effects and, and they're outside of the norm. And, and some people have them and some people don't. And nobody knows why. But what we know is we put something into our body and it does something to us and, and that's the something that we want. So we put it into our bodies. If we waited until we understood medication to use medication, we'd have no medication, right? But at some point, you have to say the benefit's greater than the risk, so I'm going to step forward and, and, and take something. So Solomon says, 
Look at the design of things and then take steps. Now, he's not saying don't be prudent. I'm not saying don't be prudent with your med- you know, I, We're not saying that, right? With, medica- with medication such. But the point is, what is he saying here? So in the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, withhold not your hand. In other words, in the morning, work what you expect to, to go well. And then just in case that doesn't go well, in the evening, pursue something else. Pursue some other pursuit of, of, of your livelihood. And then if your crops grow because the rains come and everything goes well, then you've got the crops. And if it doesn't go well, you've got, you've got your second plan here. That's prudence. And you know what? If the crops do go well, then you've got them both. So he's saying here, right? For no, thou knowest not whether, sh- whether shall prosper, which one shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be li- alike good. Think ahead. Now, I'm not trying to give you a motivational speech today. I'm not here to, to, to give you a life speech. I, I'm, I'm preaching the Bible. But what we're talking about is maturity. And remember, Solomon's talking to young people. And next week, we, we get to get a little bit deeper into the spiritual end of things. Serve God with the strength of your youth is where we're going with this. But a part of growing up, kids, is growing up. <laughs> it's profound, isn't it? A part of getting taller, a part of your brain developing, a part of getting stronger is, is becoming mature. Not just taking your place in society, not just taking your place in the family, but taking your place in the church. Serving the Lord with your strength, with your might, with your mind. Solomon says you need to grow up. The mature man or woman doesn't get frozen into indecision. He thinks, he does the best he can, he acts, he gets busy. You may not know how you can serve the church best. You may not be the best evangelist. You may not be the best at this. But, but if there's a place in the church that needs you, take some initiative and fill it. That's maturity. So let's talk about these in application form today. Marks of immaturity. Let's look through these today as the Bible presents them and let's see how you're doing. Number one, are you childish? Young children are by nature selfish. Children want what they want. They live to satisfy their own cravings and desires. But those who are growing or grown can act this way as well. Acting like everything is about you focused on getting what you want, even at the expense of others. Princes who spend their days partying rather than leading their people. Fathers, bosses, pastors who spend their day pursuing their priorities instead of God's priorities, instead of the needs of their family, instead of the needs of their uh, their employees, instead of the needs of their congregation. Maybe there are some fathers in this room who are childish. You have been called to lead your family, but instead you demand the family revolve around you like the sun. Adapt to your whims and then leave them to kind of fend for themselves. It's immaturity. Maybe there are mothers in this room who are childish. When mom's not happy, no one's happy, and you use this tactic to get what you want out of your family and out of your husband. It's childish. Children. I mentioned children are immature by nature, but young people, you don't have to be immature. It's a choice. You must be taught to grow up, but you're never too young to understand that life is not about you. You're never too young to be told that the less you think about yourself, the better off you'll be. And by the way, the happier you'll be. You're never too young to be told that maturity, growing up, means taking responsibility. It doesn't mean you've turned 18. It doesn't mean you've turned 21. It doesn't mean you have a driver's license. It means that you take responsibility for your actions. It means you are dependable for others. It means you're putting others ahead of yourself. And it means, in the long run, that God is at the top. Maybe there are some Christians in this room who are childish. You want the church to cater to your desires, what you want, but you are not interested in contributing in return. You think God exists to serve you, to give you stuff, to make you happy. 
And when things don't go your way, you do what children do. You pout, you whine, you fuss, cold shoulder, break stuff, give ultimatums. It's a mark of immaturity. How are you doing today? Yes, the physical level matters. It's a part of the testimony of the church and society. But there's a spiritual element to this too. How are you doing? Are you a childish person? Question number two, are you a slothful or idle person? From verses 18 and 19. Do you spend all of your time wasting your time sitting on the couch doing nothing? I met a young man a, long, uh, a, a little while ago and I've, I, I don't know that I've used him in a sermon for Sunday morning, Sunday evening. I think I've mentioned him in Sunday school on Tuesday night a couple of times already. But I met a young man a while ago and we got into a conversation about video games. And he, uh, he and his, his dad are, are Christians, um, but you know, sir, not, not at all in our circles or anything of the sort. And he had a tally. You know, there's some, uh, com he's a computer gamer, and, and, and you can actually tally the number of hours that you've played video game. And one particular video game, he told me he had logged over 9,000 hours on it. He's 16 years old. 9,000 hours working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year is years of his life that he spent doing something that gives you a little achievement box on a, on a screen and then is gone forever. It does nothing for you. Zero, zilch. No, he, how much could he have learned? 9,000 hours. If he'd have read books for 9,000 hours, imagine what he could have learned. If he'd have put himself to a trade for 9,000 hours, We've got a master electrician and a master plumber in here. I wonder how many hours it took them of training to become a master. 9,000 hours is a lot of hours. And that was one of his video games. There's a problem there, folks. Culture is stealing our lives. Idleness and slothfulness is stripping from us our very lives. The very thing that God has given to us to serve him, we're yielding for nothing. We're giving it away, and you can't get it back. Now, again, I'm not averse to amusements. I'm not preaching against amusements today. But we've got to gain some perspective here, folks. Idleness is a mark of immaturity. Are you a productive person? especially young people. These are the strongest years of your life. If you're, if, if you're 15 or above, you, you, your body is strong, your mind is strong, you've got energy. These are the years to grow, to learn, to become something that God can use. Can you do it afterwards? Yes, you can, but it's going to get harder. Learning's going to get slower. Energy is going to become less. Uh, responsibilities are going to become greater. These are the years to start, young people. And our adolescents today, our young people today, they're lazy. They're slothful. Are you being a spiritually productive person? Let me bring this back to everyone here. Are you spiritually productive? Are you spiritually impactful? Are you spiritually growing? Are you spiritually impacting others? I got a card in the mail this last Wednesday opened it up for, for the church, opened it up, and there was $40 cash in that card, and there was a note from a church in the cities. Pastor, your church is the church on our list this week. We're praying for you. We love you. Take your wife out for a meal, 40 bucks. A very little bit of time that it took them to find in the phone book a list of independent Baptist churches to put 40 bucks in an envelope with a, with a, a letter that says we love you and then to spend time during their weekly prayer meeting on Wednesday night praying for Legacy Baptist Church and Pastor Jamin Wickler. And yet, that very little bit of time is something that a lot of us don't even give. Are we being spiritually productive or are we spiritually idle? Question number three, are you indiscreet? Verse 20, so we mentioned words last week 
Uh, the whole message was on the tongue, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. Remember, this is the verse where it says, don't speak against your leaders because a bird will carry it to him, right? And, and, and so are you indiscreet? Proverbs 21, verse 23 says, whoso keepeth his mouth keepeth, and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. We talked about this in the, in the question of are you putting your foot in your mouth, right, last week. Are, are, you, are you getting yourself in trouble with your words? We're not going to dwell on it for long again, but... Have you ever said something maybe in just passing, but it was unkind, and you didn't do it because you didn't like the person, just to be funny, thinking that it would never get back to them, and it did, and they were hurt? We talked about this last week. You regretted it because you never should have said it. It never should have come out of your mouth to begin with. And we mentioned last week it's the mark of a fool. It's also a mark of immaturity. That you just can't. Keep your mouth shut. We need to be careful. Far better that we keep our mouth shut than to open it and say something that we'll regret. Are you mature? We won't dwell on that one. Next question, are you short-sighted? Verses one through three of chapter 11. The mature man does not just, he, he doesn't worry about tomorrow, but he thinks about tomorrow. There's a distinction, isn't there? He thinks about tomorrow, but he doesn't worry about tomorrow. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 6, Take no thought for the morrow, shall the, for the morrow shall take thought for the needs of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He's not saying don't plan ahead. He's saying don't worry ahead. God has not graced you for tomorrow's problems today. God's graced you for today. The mature man doesn't put all of his eggs into one basket, though. The mature man understands that the way that, that this world works, the design of this world is such that sin has an influence, it has an effect, bad things happen. So he does his best to protect himself and others through thoughtfulness and strategy. Psalm 112 verse 5, a good man showeth favor and lendeth, he will guide his affairs with discretion. A good man is generous. A good man looks ahead and positions himself for success. A good man lives a day at a time but looks beyond that day in preparation. Solomon has a lot to say about this in the Proverbs as well. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man lendeth, and, uh, leaveth, excuse me, an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Proverbs 27, 12, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple passed on and are punished. We're talking here about looking ahead and having discernment. Are you doing it? There are times in our lives where it's all we can do to live day by day, but when it is within the power of, our, our, of ourselves, of our situation to look ahead, people that are mature do so. And this is not, again, just physically, this is spiritually. Pa uh, fathers, I've told you before, I've, I've instructed you before, I've, I've exhorted you before, you need to have a spiritual plan for your family. Don't just say we're just going to live life and read the Bible. Have spiritual goals. My, my child is struggling in this area of their lives. So this next year, this is where we're going to focus. So we, we did this last year with, with my girls in 2017. And we set a couple of spiritual, uh, not just my girls, but you know, they're the older ones. We, we set some spiritual goals and we've been trying to live out those spiritual goals. In 2018, we have a new one. Uh, I've noticed that lately my children have become very shy in wanting to publicly minister. We go to the nursing home, they don't want to sing. They'll, they'll come up and shake hands, but they don't want to sing as a family. And while I get that, children are shy and such, um, they're missing out on ministry because of their inhibitions. So 2018, one of the spiritual goals will be helping our children recognize that, decide that ministry needs to be, ministry to the Lord needs to be more important than what a person may think of me. My wife and I get up every couple of weeks and we sing a song and it's not because we're good singers. That's not the point, right? We sing unto the Lord and we seek to encourage the body. We minister for the sake of the Lord as unto the Lord and not unto men. So we need, so, so, so as, as a father, I set a spiritual goal. This is me trying to foresee the evil, trying to, to, to understand my children's needs and, and, and get ahead of them a little bit to help my children become what they need to become. Spiritually, physically, it's a mark of maturity that we're looking ahead, that we're planning ahead, that we're seeking to guide ourselves and those that 
depend on us into physical and spiritual success. The ultimate principle of maturity. It's fun to invest in the pleasures of this world, but if I have the farsightedness to see that it's all going to end up burning up, the farsightedness to recognize that there's an eternity on the other end of this life, then I'm going to be living today because I'm looking ahead to eternity, right? Final one, as far as questions are concerned, then we'll have one more point. Are you indecisive? Do you spend so much of your time thinking that you never do? Do you spend so much of your time planning that it never becomes action? Are you so caught up in the nuances that you never actually get to the actions? It's a mark of immaturity. There are men and women who agonize over the smallest of details to no result. There are detail-oriented persons that are a blessing to the church, that are a blessing to businesses because they're detail-oriented. But if we agonize over the details to the expense of action, then what are we doing? We failed. There are those among us who get so stuck in the maybes and the what ifs and the reality uh, 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 as, as we see it that, that, that we can't move ahead and get to work. So they fail to do anything, frozen into an action. The old story is of Thomas Jefferson's attempt to invent the light bulb. And in a certain publication, they asked him about all of his failures. And a quote he once gave is this. If I find 10,000 ways something won't work, I haven't failed, I'm not discouraged because every wrong attempt discarded is another step forward toward finding the right one, right? Toward finding the right way. The idea is that an attempt failed is simply another data point in how not to do it so that we can do it right the next time. But if I'm so busy worrying about all the ways I might fail that I never try, I do no good to anyone. So Solomon says in verses four through six, plant in the morning, do something else in the evening and one of them will work out and then you'll, you'll be okay. We can't predict everything. We can't control everything. And if we wait until we can, we'll never do anything physically and we'll never do anything fear spiritually, folks. If the deems waited until everything was under their control before they started distributing stuff all around the world, it never would have happened. Now, the fact is we all bear tendencies towards some of these, right? I don't, my, my goal was not that we all walk away saying we're all immature. <laughs> Just like last week, my goal was not that we all walk away saying we all have speech problems. That's not, I, I, I don't, my goal is not to discourage you this morning, but the goal is to give the means by which for the Holy Spirit to place his thumb on certain things in our lives and say we can do better here. We can be better for our families. We can be better for our church. We can be better for the Lord. Christian maturity is reflected not just in a person who has enough initiative to get a job and live, but a person who is farsighted and clear thinking enough to live for the Lord. And this leads us to the final point, a point which you might be a little familiar with by this point in Ecclesiastes. Man can find lasting satisfaction. All throughout the book, Solomon says it's not found in money and it's not found in, what, in, in, in possessions and it's not found in power and it's not found in knowledge and it's not found in building projects and it's not found in honor. And he says, if man wants lasting satisfaction, and we're going to get to the grand conclusion in, in just a few weeks, Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, fear God and keep his commandments. That's what brings lasting satisfaction. But again, as we think of it today, let me direct you towards Paul in Romans chapter 13, where he says this, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul says here, we have a limited time and spiritually speaking, it's time to wake up. It's time to grow up. It's time for us to get busy. It's time for us to put off the works of darkness that we lived in in the night because now we've awakened out of darkness and we're living in the light. So get rid of the things that, that you would want to pursue, the marks of immaturity, the marks of the flesh, and put on the spirit and get busy serving the Lord. Think ahead. Live for others. Serve others. Be discreet. Be farsighted. Be decisive. Make steps for the Lord. Get busy doing. Don't be slothful. Don't be idle. Don't be childish. 
Growing up doesn't just make you productive for your family. Growing up doesn't just make you productive for society. Those are almost nice side effects. But the reason why young people, your parents and your pastor and your church, and the reason why we want you to be mature is so that you can be useful to God. Because if you're stuck in yourself, and if you're slothful, and if you're idle, and if you're indiscreet, and if you're short-sighted, and if you're indecisive, then you're not going to have as many tools as you could have for the Lord. How are you doing today? Are you a mature person? Are you a mature Christian? As those who are followers of God, the greatest satisfaction is found when we are doing what God has called us to do, when we're useful to God. Are you useful? Are you useful for God for his purposes? Let's close in prayer.